and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this really quite exceptional event, uh, marking the historic visit of the General Council of the University of Edinburgh and indeed the University uh, to Hong Kong and Hong Kong University. It's been uh, so far an extraordinary weekend of academic engagement and collaboration, celebration of the links between Edinburgh and Hong Kong, the cities and the universities. And highlights so far have been a really wonderful uh, climate change conference yesterday, and then the honorary degree ceremonies at which we were able to celebrate and recognize the achievements of, of Madam Su Lin, the, the general director uh, Hanban, of Confucius uh, Hanban, and Professor Lapchi Xu, the vice chancellor, chancellor of this university, of Hong Kong University. And now we come to the General Council Lecture, which is uh, a very uh, unique event in the sense that it's, it's come to Hong Kong. It, it travels uh, on a regular basis. I think one in four is the frequency. And this time it's Hong Kong. And I think we're all absolutely delighted, honored, and privileged to be here. So the General Council Lecture on this occasion is also rather special, and it's going to be delivered by uh, Professor Tom Devine. The University of Edinburgh, just like the University of Hong Kong University, has many internationally renowned experts and opinion leaders from, in the case of Edinburgh, across all the, the major academic disciplines. And none more so uh, uh, renowned and auspicious than our Professor of Scottish History and Paleography, Tom Devine, who I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be able to introduce today. Uh, Professor Devine is not only one of Edinburgh's most um, nationally and internationally celebrated academics, he also professes one of Edinburgh's truly sentinel subjects, and that is Scottish history. And Tom, as you will know, has published many numerous academic articles and books on the subject of Scottish history and had many international and national awards for his accomplishments. And he's currently uh, engaged in the completion of the third in a trilogy that has assessed, that assesses the impact of Scotland and Scots on developments throughout the Eastern Hemisphere over the last three centuries. And today he's going to lecture to us on the theme of an empire of commerce, three centuries of Scottish enterprise in the East. But he tells me this translates more appropriately to how the British ruled the empire, but the Scots ran it. Let's see, <laughs> Professor Devine. Thank you. You're right. Um, well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, Steve, for those generous introductory remarks. It's, um, it's a personal honor for me to, to be asked on behalf of the university and the general council uh, of this great institution um, to give this uh, lecture. It's a privilege also because it's very rare for an historian, especially an historian looking at uh, an overseas set of territories, to be able to give a presentation in the place for some of these activities in the past and those experiences in the past actually took place. But I want to begin my presentation closer to the present because I think uh, when Hong Kong was transferred to the People's, Public, People's Republic of, of China in the summer of 1997, uh, the ceremonial, at least to a Scottish historian, uh, was replete uh, with metaphor and symbol. Um, although there was no Scottish regiment involved in the garrisoning of the territory in the months before the transfer, perhaps predictably, detachments of the 42nd Regiment of Foot, better known to you as the Black Watch, were flown in to carry out a leading element, a leading part uh, in the ceremonial. And I was looking at uh, a grainy film of this celebration um, just a few days ago with the rain tumbling down uh, as 
the process uh, was completed. And perhaps the most emotive part, at least for a Scot, listening to this and seeing it was the pipes and drums of the Black Watch uh, playing in slow time, Auld Lang Syne. And it also reminded me of the period several years before when the first great exodus from empire took place in 1947, because then the Argyll and Southern Highlanders carried out exactly the same, the same mission. Uh, not, on neither occasion, it should be said, did the play Will You Know Come Back Again? <laughs> this is not simply an indication to me, ladies and gentlemen, of the role of the kilted soldier in imperial expansion. If you like, the vanguard of the imperial project, famed in story and song right through the 18th into the 19th and early 20th century. I see, in a sense, the role of these regiments at the dissolution of empire, that they were the pallbearers of empire in the same way as they had been the vanguard of empire. But I think even more so, in a sense, metaphorically and symbolically as well, at least in this part of the world, the fact that Scottish soldiers played such an important part in those ceremonials and are remembered for such in this territory is also to me redolent of the much wider and deeper role of the Scottish nation in this part of the world. It's got to be remembered that when this impact occurred, and it occurred mainly in the 19th century, Scotia had a population in total of only 3.5 million. But I hope you will accept and be at least semi-convinced when I finish my presentation that that very small ethnic group, slightly over 3 million, had a quite um, over-representative and disproportionate effect on the development and especially the commercial development of South Asia from the late 18th century right through to the mid 20th century, and perhaps even since I've met so many Scots in Hong Kong since I arrived to the present day. But I now want to push back in time because the Scottish connection with this part of the world started in a dark way. It started, in a sense, with a national disaster. In the late 17th century, just a few years before the Union of 1707, the Scottish nation was in crisis. Four years of harvest failure, the effect of European war and tariff barriers, and it was beginning to squeeze, especially Scottish international trade. And the governing classes of Scotland in that period looked for an option out of this gathering, of this gathering a problem in the 1690s. And they took what now looks, and was described most recently by one eminent Scottish historian, not simply as a gamble, but something that ended as a tragic farce. They took the extraordinary step of trying to establish a colony, a Scottish colony on the Isthmus of Panama, in the area now known as Darien, in order to create an emporium a Scottish emporium which would cut off the great journey around the Cape of Good Hope to India and Asia and enable Scotland to exploit the possibilities in a massive scale of the very lucrative spice trade from India and especially, of course, as the, late, the, the 18th century went on later, uh, the massive importation also of, of, of tea. As the progenitor of the plan, William Patterson had it, it will open the door of the seas and the key to the universe. At one bound, a small, relatively deprived nation, one of the poorest in Western Europe, would be able to climb up there with the low countries, with England, and with other uh, more advanced economies. It was perhaps destined to fail because not only was the spot chosen full of swamp-filled sources of disease, but also Darien was midway between the Spanish bullion exporting ports of Cartagena and Portobello. And in particular, 
the new King of England and Scotland, William III, William of Orange, had very good reasons for keeping a close alliance and a close association with Spain. And this Scottish intervention in the heart of the Spanish Empire was to say the least unacceptable, distasteful, and totally and utterly in, uh, uh, undiplomatic. This, still, this fiasco, this disaster, resulting in the loss of five of the seven ships of the company, resulting in 350 dead, buried in large pits in Panama, including William Patterson's wife and child. The effect it had on almost semi-bankrupting semi the nation, which lost 400,000 pounds sterling. Multiply that by 80 to get modern, modern values. And not least, the failure was almost certainly an important trigger for the Union of 1707, because having failed in this colonial enterprise, the Scottish elites gradually started to realize that the only option, apart from continued disaster, was within, if you like, the armor plate of the British state. And a few years after the collapse at Darien, the Union of 1707 was signed and still intact despite revolution uh, to this day. So, the Scottish connection with the East begins in great difficulty, begins in crisis. But then you fast forward into the 18th, late 18th and into the 19th century. Take 1800, just 100 years after the Darien fiasco, and you look at the membership of the East India Company, still called the East India Company of England. By 1800, population of Scotland in that period in relation to the population of Great Britain was one in 10, but 10% 10 of the British population were Scots. Look at the membership of the East India Company at about 1800. 22% of the writer grade that's the highest echelon of the civil service, Scots, young Scots, young male Scots. No less than 50%, 56% of the surgeons, the physicians of the company, who were absolutely vital on the long passage out from Great Britain around the Cape of Good Hope. The military officers in the company's army, nearly two thirds were Scots, although intriguingly, the rank and file were overwhelmingly Catholic, Catholic Irish. And then, what was going to be very important for the future, as we'll discover later in the presentation, the private traders, those who were involved in the country trade, eventually to, to China, and particularly, of course, in the first instance, to Canton. We begin to see already by 1800, very striking Scottish penetration of what's going to become the basis for what I've termed in this lecture, the Scottish commercial empire of the 18th and 19th centuries. So what I'm saying to you is this. In a sense, what Scotland tried to do in the last decade of the 17th century was knock down the door of the British Empire in the East, was to try and gain access to these lucrative areas of commerce by a full frontal assault on the privileges of the East India Company. What happened as the 18th century developed in relation to the EIC, in relation to the East India Company, was, to use a kind of metaphor, the Scottish merchants, the Scottish civil servants, the Scottish military men went round the back door. And they penetrated the empire, not in an overt way, but almost by a process of stealth. So we end up just a few years before the East India Company loses its monopoly. It had become almost a Scottish-run management, management structure that had been almost an, an ethnic transformation in the composition of the company. And that caused much hatred, envy, and jealousy in London. It then moved forward into the mid-19th century, the 1850s, 1860s. By then, 
there were something of the order of 21 to 22 major British companies trading in everything from rubber through to tea to opium and also controlling very much of the steamship lines of this part of the world. The Orient had become almost a British Mediterranean in the sense that Italy had access to the Mediterranean in the medieval and early modern period. Out of that group of giant, colossal commercial syndicates by the 1850s, 1860s, my calculation is perhaps at least a dozen were Scottish-owned and Scottish-based. And some of these, um, even to those who are not familiar with the commercial history of Asia, some of these names will be very familiar to you, particularly those who live in this part of the world. The most famous of all, and still to a large extent, is the same case here, Jardine, Matheson & Company, by that period controlling no less than two-thirds of the external trade of China, and particularly dominating, perhaps not nowadays what is regarded as a clearly evil form of commerce, but then was accepted in the main, clearly dominating the inward importation of Indian opium from India to China in, in, uh, in exchange for, for tea and other commodities. Founded by William Jardine from Loch Mabin in Dumfrieshire and James Matheson from Lairg in Sutherland. Um, of the two, Jardine was a formidable character. It was reckoned that he would never have anything other than one seat in his office, which he sat on, so that visitors had to stand. He was known by the Chinese in Canton. I can't speak it in the, in the actual original language, so this is the translation. Iron-headed old rat. Iron-headed old rat. The reason for this was, when presenting a petition to the imperial court in Canton, an iron bar, or a very heavy bar, had fallen on him, and he walked on without flinching. And this was, a, in, uh, this was supposed to be, a, in a sense, a, a physical indicator of the personality of the man. Uh, Matheson is remembered in Benjamin Disraeli's novel, Sybil. When Matheson returned to Scotland, he bought the island of Lewis for 500,000 pounds in 1842. He's referred to in Disraeli's novel as he is as rich as Croesus, one Mac drug, Mac for the Scot, drug for the trade in which they had been involved, one Mac drug who has returned to this country with a million of opium in each pocket. And one of the great ironies of this story, ladies and gentlemen, is that in 1846, the Western Highlands and Islands were afflicted by the dreaded potato blight, Phytophthora infestans, which of course caused in Ireland the greatest human catastrophe of the 19th century. And Matheson was knighted and became Sir James Matheson as a consequence of saving the population through the dispensation of relief, saving the population of Lewis uh, during that decade, 1846 to 1856. But then at the end of the decade, because of the failure of his improvement schemes on the island, he virtually forcibly removed through the agency of his chamberlain, his estate chamberlain, William Mackenzie, he forcibly removed no, longer, no, no less than 2,200 people to Canada in one of, the, uh, one of the major episodes of what we call the Highland Clearances. So they are gigantic, and still are, as you know. By the end of the 19th century, Jardine, Matheson and Company alone employed 100,000 people in Asia. But then second, and probably even greater, but now forgotten, McKinnon, Mackenzie and Company, led by Sir William McKinnon from Campbelltown. Um, McKinnon, a small, dapper man, very self-effacing, but arguably, and I've compared them with the activities um, of some of the great uh, Scottish tycoons in, in the States, people like Andrew Carnegie. Arguably, McKinnon could be regarded as the greatest Scottish tycoon of all. By the time, just before he gave up and surrendered control 
of the six companies that he bestrode. McKinnon, McKenzie and Company and the related cadet branches had control over no less than 240 steamships which ran voyages and trade between, um, at one extreme, East Africa, right through to India, part of this world here, onto China, and as far as Australasia. It was an extraordinary commercial empire based, based on shipping. That was then swallowed up eventually, and was now known as, or at least is, is, became part of the Inchcape Group, again a name which might be familiar to you. There's plenty of others. Guthrie's, um, their roots were in the area around Brecon uh, in uh, Forfarshire in Scotland. Became the greatest rubber trading company and plantation owning company um, in, uh, in, in Malaya, before of course it became Malaysia after the end. It's one of the clear examples about the demise of some of these companies. Guthrie's survived right through into the second half of the 20th century and then was nationalized by the Malaysian state. It's one explanation why some of these organizations are no longer with us today. James Finlay and Company, developing out of um, the cotton manufacture of West Central Scotland, led by, led by the cotton lord, as it was known, Kirkman Finlay, with three major um, factory complexes in the west of Scotland producing cotton in the first phase of the Scottish Industrial Revolution. Um, but then, massively and radically and dramatically diversifying into tea, and to this day, owning tea plantations, particularly in India and Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka, uh, of, of, of course. The Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, founded by Thomas Sutherland, um, became, by the end of the 19th century, the basic financial infrastructure of this part of the world, the premier financial source of capital and credit in the Orient, and all based on Scottish principles, a central bank with sub-branches. Um, and talking to one of the last, probably the last, Scottish managing um, director, Willie Purvis, uh, Sir William Purvis of Kelso, he recalled when he joined the bank, the HSBC, in the uh, period immediately after World War II, serried ranks of young Scotch banking clerks over here learning their craft. By that particular period, for better or for worse, and we do not know the answer to this, the Scots had a badge. It may, may, may not have been justified, it may have been justified, but they had a badge of identity as bankers, physicians, doctors, and not least ships engineers in this part of the world, even being granted the privilege of a place on the deck of the Starfleet Enterprise in Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty. Played by a, a Canadian of Irish or origin with a peculiar semi Lanarkshire accent. Um, only the Jap Japanese, the Russians, and I think that was it, were allowed the privilege along with the Americans of being on the flight deck of the Starship Enterprise. It was a clear indication of the iconography that had built up around, if you like, the legend of some of these, um, of these individuals who spent a lot of their lives in this part of the world. Um, and the, one could go on with, with, with the list. I've only mentioned several of the, the most important and familiar names. But I was interviewed on the radio yesterday, and I could not um, resist mentioning Burma Oil. Uh, Burma Oil, surround, uh, founded by a set of um, families, in particular the Cargill family uh, from Glasgow, uh, was the progenitor of a company which is in the news at the moment, British Petroleum, BP. And the radio interviewer said, thank God we are not carrying out this interview in American soil, because after what you've just said, BP, you know, is not a very uh, desirable uh, or acceptable um, organization, it's particularly in the, the Mississippi area. 
in, in, in the USA uh, to today because of the great catastrophe that's occurred uh, in the Gulf, the Gulf down there. So that's the descriptive part of what I wanted to say to you this afternoon. Hopefully, the more interesting part, part is the analytical part because it's the task of the historian not simply to narrate and describe and to get as far as one can a sense of the past, a sense of the past with absolute intellectual honesty and integrity and present the story warts and all, light and shade. But the, prim the primary focus of my discipline is explanation or attempted explanation. So we now move, move on to the second uh, part of what I want to say to you and consider some of the reasons why we get this ethnic predominance, why we don't see the same degree of overrepresentation in this area, in this region, from England, from Wales, or from Ireland. What was it, or what factors advantaged the Scots? And one of the great difficulties and perils of this task, ladies and gentlemen, is what I've referred to in print as the Burden Supper School of Scottish History. And by that I mean the, the danger of being sucked into ethnic conceit, the danger of, you know, who, where, whose tears was like us. Not many in their old deed. What I want to try and do is get behind that into what I would call the structural factors, the advantages that Scottish merchants and adventurers had, uh, which allowed them to adopt and prevail in this semi-dominating role. Because one of the remarkable things about this story is, it is not unique to the East. The same kind of processes were at work in Canada, in the USA before 1783, when it was uh, part of the colonial empire. And the same thing is at work also in the same period in South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. The traditional historical illiteracy of the Scot, because of the way Scottish history has been so marginalized until recently in Scottish schools, means that hardly anything of what I'm saying to you today, have said to you and will say, is known even to the majority of highly educated Scottish people. It's almost as if we've experienced a full-scale national collective amnesia over our imperial and global, our imperial, and I would argue more than imperial, global past. All right, the first, the first thing to try and do is to look at the EIC, the East India Company, and how do we explain the fact that they were willing and eventually uh, had to accept a Scottish ascendancy within the membership of uh, an organization which was one of the most difficult to enter because of the returns that uh, could be gained. In the mid-18th century, ladies and gentlemen, if you went as a young man, 14, 15, 16 years of age, out to India um, as a cadet and maybe a junior writer, 60%, uh, 65% was the average death rate before the age of 25. If you survived, the chances are that in that period of imperial plunder, you could return at least with an independency to Scotland. And one of the things that Scottish historians are very interested in at the moment is the way in which the flow of capital back from the successful individuals in the East in the 18th and early 19th century helped to propel through capitalization the Scottish industrial and agricultural uh, re revol re revolutions. It's an amazing thing to me to reflect upon the fact that one reason for this is Charles Edward Stewart. Bonnie Prince Charlie. And the link between that man who died in debauched alcoholism in Rome in the 1780s and this part of the world uh, is a, an interesting, I think, an interesting and intrig intriguing tale. Briefly, it's this. After the Union, the expected economic revolution and advance in Scotland which the pro-unionists had argued for, did not take place. There was almost a revolution of frustrated expectations. Instead, taxation rose and interference started with Scottish religious structures. The consequence was disillusionment, disaffection, urban riot, 
and above all the rise of Jacobitism. Four major rebellions, 1709, 1715, 1719, and the most famous of all, 45-6. The connection with Charles Edward Stuart and the East India Company is the British government had to decide whether to occupy Scotland and render the northern border secure from the French or adopt a different procedure. And the different procedure was patronage. And patronage was used in large amounts. Promises of posts, jobs, promotions, favours in the English East India Company. From the 1720s onwards, genteel but impoverished Scottish gentry families were being stroked by London and by um, uh, the Duke of Argyll, the, um, the administration's manager, political manager in Scotland. And although one is not saying that the growth of the Scot in the EIC was not generated by quality, it was also very important that this political force was in question. And that ascendancy in the English East India Company was crucial to the later development through to China. Because one of the perquisites, one of the perks of being a civil servant in the EIC was the capacity to trade, not with Britain directly, but in the so-called country trade. And in my own work, I've detected so many former East India servants, Jardine was one of them, William Jardine was one of them, who started, he was a physician, he was a doctor, a graduate of this institution, or an alumnus of this institution, as was James Matheson, although Matheson was in humanities, and uh, majored, if you like to put it, in political economy. Um, moving in away from his primary specialization into commerce, into profit, because this story is fraught with heroism, risk-taking, adventuring, but it's also about greed and the lust for profit, almost some, sometimes to a ruthless, a ruthless extent. So its ascendancy in the EIC then becomes the platform for the development of these large-scale companies in the 19th century. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a necessary but not a sufficient explanation of this, uh, this uh, historical puzzle. There are two other elements to be considered in the time available to me. The first element is to see this not as something odd and eccentric, something that developed out of a vacuum in the 19th century in the Orient, but to see it as a continuum, to see this as one further manifestation of the Scottish commercial empire at work. Because if you widen the chronological lens and go back to the medieval and particularly the early modern periods, they were already active in doing this kind of thing in Central Europe. Not a, lot of pe not a lot of people know that in the middle decades of the 17th century, there were 420 small Scottish settlements up and down the great river valley of the Vistula. So extensive was the role of the Scot in Scandinavia, but particularly in Poland, Lithuania, that they met annually in 12 Scottish brotherhoods, almost a kind of external external parliament where they discussed, um, they discussed matters of, of, mutual, of mutual concern. In the middle decades of that century, the biggest Scottish colonial um, uh, settlement, if you like, overseas was not in the, the Atlantic area, it was in Europe. And my thesis is that as the axis swung to the west, First of all, the 13 colonies, in particular Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina. Then the British, British North America, eventually Canada in 1867 with Confederation, including the slave plantations of the Caribbean, and eventually coming further east, Cape of Good Hope, but then, of course, the Indies and on to, on to China. I detect three particular, um, three particular areas of expertise that they had built up in medieval and early modern Europe that they were still using out here in the middle decades of the 19th century. 
a, a, an extraordinary continuum of what they regarded as best practice to open up frontier commercial markets, um, frontier um, trading networks. The first is this, always go for the soft underbelly. Never go for competitions in tents, always go for the periphery. I don't have the, the time to list this in terms of North America and the Caribbean, um, but you have to take it for granted that that was, that was indeed the case, and it was the case out here too. Secondly, use credit and plenty of it, almost to the point of gambling. The recent malaise of the Royal Bank of Scotland is not unique. The Scot obviously did have a reputation for prudence, but they had also a reputation for taking a risk and for commercial adventuring. And the third and perhaps the most important thing of all was although all of these ethnic groups in the period I'm talking about had their networks, the thing that differentiates the Scottish networks was the emphasis on kindred, but also the emphasis on locality. They weren't Scottish, they were regional Scottish. I mean, for example, it was boasted quite publicly that McKinnon, Sir William McKinnon, would never hire anybody who had not been born in Kintyre. The, the famous and distinguished journalist, Neil Asherson, did his national service in, um, uh, in Malaya and met, in quote marks, Lanky Guthrie, the head of Guthrie's at the time, nearly seven feet tall, thus the name Lanky. And he was told that they were using exactly the same kind of recruitment policies. They had to be able, of course, but they also had to come more or less from a particular quadrant of East Central Scotland from which Guthrie's had developed as long ago as the early 19th century. In an environment of risk, difficulty of communications, you know, the months of sailing before steamships in the Suez Canal out to this part of the world, you had to have people on whom you could trust. And the people you could trust were not simply the kin, but the, the satellite who had been recommended on the basis of having what was called the engine. Hmm? A very common Scottish word used in this period, the engine for those people who could stand the difficulty, uh, the heat, the challenges, and all the other aspects of trying to do well and prosper in an area which was, as far as Europeans were concerned, still regarded as a frontier land. So that's the first thing. If you widen the lens, this then becomes more explicable and not something which occurs out of the blue. It is, it is part of the quite extraordinary global impact of this particular ethnicity that we're uh, considering. The second thing is, one final thing, and since we started at five past, um, Steve, maybe I could go on for three or four minutes uh, after the due time of quarter two, so to allow for any questions or comments that people have. The second thing is, um, I suppose the word education is, is what comes to mind, but it's wider and deeper than simple, simply what we think is formal education. It's part of almost the, it's part of also, it's almost part of the elaboration of a kind of ideology of a value system. Pre-Reformation Scotland was not an educational desert. There were three universities, song schools, and borough schools. But what differentiated the post-reformation system, especially by the time it matured, was that it was systematic and national, at least in the lowlands. Um, my predecessor in the Fraser chair, or one of my predecessors in this chair, Professor Gordon Donaldson, put it aptly when he said, by 1660, it was the normal thing, not everywhere, but the normal thing for a lowland parish to have its school. This was the Noxian precept, that the laity had to be educated to understand the Bible. For some reason, I've been speaking from pulpits over the last few months. I said when I got my first invitation to speak uh, in a church that maybe they thought my name was D-I-V-I-N-E rather than D-E-V-I-N-E. Um, and um, 
the, the most awesome experience was in Dorna Cathedral at the UHI Millennium Institute annual lecture. And it's quite obvious when you go into these places that the dominating architectural structure is the pulpit, whereas in a Catholic church, of course, it is the altar. So systematic um, inculcation of literacy, but that affects the whole population, particularly in the lowlands. I'm more interested in the elites. These people who made up these firms were from the middle ranks of Scottish society, and it's their education which is relevant to this story. I've often wondered and posed the question in lectures, how does one explain that elements of Professor Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations were first given as lecture notes to 14 and 15 year olds, average age of entry into Scottish universities then, at the University of Glasgow. A text which is still a demanding read for postgraduate students was being taught to 14 and 15 year olds. Has there been genetic decline? I think I may, may now have at least a semi-convincing answer to this, and it's the Scottish grammar or borough schools of the 17th and 18th centuries. That's the age group 9 to 13. My calculations suggest that the amount of hours demanded by these dominies, these school teachers in these schools, was two and a half times per week the amount of effort demanded in similar schools in Italy and France. And then they were marched into the kirk on the Sunday to listen to the two-hour sermon and dissect it in the schoolroom later. If they weren't able to speak in Latin and con converse in Latin totally by the age of 11, they were thrashed indiscriminately. It was not permitted to speak English in these schools after um, the age of 11, and then they went on to, to 13. My sense, ladies and gentlemen, is if you survived that regime, you had been, and back to that word again, if you had the engine to survive it, then you were equipped to deal with what every middle class Scot, if they didn't inherit an estate, had to do, go abroad and seek fortune. And no ethnicity in Europe had been as thoroughly trained educationally. Because that was only the beginning, then on to the college period, we don't have the figures for the University of Edinburgh for the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, but for the University of Glasgow, the matriculation albums suggest that 66% of those students at Glasgow who registered between 1750 and 1850 were from the middle ranks of Scottish society. In Cambridge, measured over the same period, church, landed, and noble families. The Scottish University in the 18th century was regarded as a place where you would get solid and effective vocational training in law and medicine, and as a preparatory to that, something we've lost unfortunately, a generalized training in the philosophical arts curriculum. Not all professors in the 18th century Scottish universities were effective. Um, the man who eventually laid the deed for the foundation of Strathclyde University um, as was to come in late, the later, later centuries, Professor J John Anderson um, of Glasgow University referred in his will to the fact that his new university would not be as the University of Glasgow was, full of drones and imposters. But the essence of that system was people like myself were paid an honorarium, a basic salary. Their main source of income came from the number of students who registered for their classes and who the professor was prepared and able to sign the class ticket from. There is eloquence in his very spitting. So it was said of um, Dougal Stewart, uh, trained by Smith himself and now honored at a building in the university, uh, the modern university of Edinburgh. There was eloquence in his very spitting. Some of these teachers because they all belonged to the Scottish Enlightenment, were truly inspiring intellectually. But the main thing was that these young boys who went through that system, having been uh, going through the grueling experience of the grammar school, were fitted with a toolkit which allowed them to master the frontiers of the British Empire in the 18th century. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, It seems to me that 
not all of what I've said uh, today is irrelevant uh, to modern Scotland. The Scots did not invest in education, in universities, in the parish school system, and in grammar schools because they had a comprehensive vision of how education could transform itself into prosperity. That development, that dynamic came about for essentially religious reasons, not for reasons of spurring, not for reasons of endeavoring to attain um, uh, transformation from a rural to an urban-based society. The fastest transformation in Western Europe until forced Soviet industrialization of the 1920s and 1930s. But whatever the cause, by, eight, by the 18th century, Scotland had a system of training, a system particularly for training that middle class elite, which was second to none in Europe. As we approach difficult times in Great Britain over the next few years, and not least in Scotland, we must remember that our ancestors invested in the brain intensive sector, in the brain intensive sector, and that did not cause change immediately, did not cause immediate economic advance, but that is where, in my view at least, and perhaps I would say this as a university teacher, the nation should be thinking about very strongly and emphatically during the future years of semi-austerity. Thank you. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.